thank you everyone for your attention this afternoon. So as, as, um, as the introduction indicated, I'll be talking about climate change and its implications on production and uh, surprisingly frost events as well. So I wanted to start by really focusing on the major driver of um, climate change, and that is the concentration or the level of greenhouse gases that we have in the atmosphere. And um, this is a very short time series of the greenhouse gas emissions and the rate of emissions uh, since the 1990s. Uh, most people think that greenhouse gas emissions occur in a very sort of gentle and almost sort of linear way, but uh, I thought it was worthwhile showing you that the rate of emissions actually ch has changed and continues to change over time. What you're looking at here is, as I said, a time series of annual emissions. And if you look at the first period um, from 1990 to 1999, you can see that the average annual rate of emissions were about almost 1% per year. And then from the 2000 to 2009, that there was a marked acceleration in the rate of emissions annually, uh, increasing to about 3% per year. Um, if you look at the, the sort of V-shape that you can see, just uh, if you look up from 2010, uh, a few questions were asked about what that is. And really, that is the downturn in global um, production as a function of the, the global financial crisis. So you can see that it has a very short term impact, but then almost um, sort of very, very shortly after that, there is a recovery. And so the most recent period, we've returned to a rate of greenhouse gas emissions of almost about 1% per year. Now in 2019, the, the total emissions at a global scale were about 36.8 gigatons, and that represents a 0.6% increase from the year before in 2018. Now, just to give you some idea of, of the, um, what this actually means in terms of some, some, some marks in time, in uh, 2015, the Paris Agreement was established, and that is a global agreement, a voluntary agreement, to try and keep emissions to a point at which uh, global temperatures don't exceed one and a half degrees of warming. Now that was established back in 2015. So um, based on the 2019 um, emission values, we're about 4% higher than we were back in 2015. And when the very first intergovernmental panel on climate change report was set out in 2019, if we compare the emissions uh, then with the emissions now, we now have about 60% uh, more uh, emissions in our atmosphere than we did back in the early 1990s. So what I wanted to, to really focus on now was this idea of what it takes to keep us uh, below or at one and a half degrees warmer in the future. So if you think about uh, a bucket um, with the greenhouse gases contained in them, and once the bucket is full, we're actually committing ourselves to one and a half degrees of warming. Um, so what by 2019, if you look at uh, where we are at the moment, um, you can see that there's about 9% of the bucket's capacity left before we, we absolutely commit ourselves to one and a half degrees of warming. And what you can see in there as well is the different contributions that are being made by the European Union, which is at the bottom in that yellow color, uh, the US, which is quite large, as you can see in the blue, um, China and India, and then the rest of the world in that sort of aggregated brown color. 
So really, if we think about that sort of 9% left in the bucket and cast your mind back to the previous slide, which was saying that we have a 1% growth in emissions every year, it sort of equates to approximately a decade um, before we actually absolutely commit ourselves to, to one and a half degrees of warming. So a lot of the questions that I've also been asked very recently is we had record breaking temperatures in 2019. What are the indicators for, for 2020? And the, the slide that you see uh, in front of you is a slide that shows the temperature anomalies uh, for the December, January and February period compared to um, the long term average, which was calculated from 1981 to 2010. And so what you can see is that most of, of Europe, uh, Russia, North, North Africa, um, those temperature anomalies for that December, January, February period are in some cases upwards of about four and a half degrees warmer than that period. If you look at Australia, Australia is sort of that one and a half to about three and a half degrees warmer, depending on uh, where you are in the country, um, than that, that uh, long term mean period. So initial indications would suggest that we're in for another warm year, whether it's a record breaking year as warm as 2019, well, that remains to be seen, but certainly we've started off the year um, much warmer than, than the long term average. In terms of focusing now down just onto the Australian temperatures, and um, I just wanted to show you the time series that st stretches back to 1910. Now, the, the zero line represents the average annual temperature calculated over the period 1990 to 1961. Any departure from that zero line represents either a year that is warmer or a year that is colder. And the blue bars represent colder years and the red bars represent um, warmer years. So the bar that's sort of furthest on the right hand side is the most recent year, which is uh, 2019, showing that Australian temperatures were one and a half degrees warmer than, than that long-term mean period. And that supersedes the sort of last warmest year in 2013, and before that, 2005, and before that, you can see 1998. What was markedly different last year was the maximum temperatures. They were the warmest on record, but they smashed uh, the previous records, which were established back in 2013. And those maximum temperatures averaged across the whole country were two, almost 2.1 degrees Celsius warmer than the, the long-term maximum temperatures. So very, very anomalously warm uh, maximum temperatures. And that coupled with um, the sort of declines in, in rainfall that we saw last year of the order of about 40% less than the long-term mean uh, made conditions uh, very, very challenging. I don't need to, to tell any of you seated here today that. Um, what I wanted to show you though, was how our climatic environment is actually changing. And if you look at this next slide, which plots annual rainfall and annual uh, temperatures together for, so this is a national average for Australia. And so for any one year, you have an average uh, national rainfall amount and you have an average national temperature amount. So what you can see is if we look at the, the historical record before the 1950s, those are um, highlighted in blue dots. You can see that there's a range of, of warmer, drier conditions, 
and colder, wetter conditions. Then in the, uh, the, the next period, the 1951 to 2000, what you can see is we still have that wetter and drier sort of um, range in our um, envelope, but the envelope has shifted up, so uh, indicating warmer conditions being experienced. What is quite marked, though, is when we look at the most recent record from 2001 to, to present, uh, you can see that the temperatures have jumped considerably and the range of wetter and drier has actually shifted towards the drier end of the spectrum. And I'll draw your attention to 2019, which is right on the outer boundary of, of that envelope. So we've seen at a national scale, we've seen considerable um, climatic variation over our historical record. Now, if we zone in to, to look at uh, Galagambone, what I wanted to show you here was comparing two periods in time. Uh, so the first one is a 1960 to 1991, and the second period is 1992 to 2019. And what you're looking at there is, is it, the extreme temperatures, both the, the extreme cold temperatures, which are on the left-hand side, and the extreme warm temperatures, which are on the, the right-hand side of the, of, of the slide. So if you were looking at, say, a temperature of 44 degrees Celsius uh, back in the, the period 1960 to 1991, if you look at the, the blue um, um, sort of distribution there, you can see that on average, um, 44 degrees Celsius occurred about 8% of, of the time. If we now look at the most recent part of the record, which is that sort of red envelope, you can see that now occurs about 37% of the time on average in the record. So a dramatic jump in the frequency of occurrence of those, those temperatures. And you can see that's consistent for temperatures of 48 right through to temperatures of, of 40 degrees. So from 40 to 48, the frequency in the most recent part of the record is much, much higher. On the cold end of, of, of the sort of temperature record, what we can see is that temperatures from zero to about minus three degrees have declined in frequency. So they're now less frequent in the recent record than they were in the earlier part of the record. Um, and for instance, if we look at uh, minus two degrees Celsius, uh, that was occurring about 34% of the time uh, during 1960 to 1991. Uh, in the most recent record, that's now only occurring probably about 13% of the time. So some considerable shifts in temperature extremes in this, in this region. And if we look at the rainfall, um, we see some very interesting changes in the distribution. So clearly we're seeing an increase in the frequency of drier uh, years. And so you can see that um, at rainfall events annually of, of around that 400 millimeter mark are now about 10% more frequent in the record, um, the, in the most recent record than they were in the earlier part of the record. What, what is interesting though, is if you look on the extreme wet end of the scale, there are now um, annual rainfall amounts that have occurred um, that are much higher than they were in the, in the earlier part of the record. So uh, rainfall, annual rainfall totals exceeding a thousand millimeters. So we've had certainly observed changes in both rainfall and temperature. So I wanted to go back to, to the temperature part of the record to really um, hit home that it's really important to take a closer look at the temperature trends. When you look at maps from the, the Bureau of Meteorology, what you're looking at is the average uh, minimum temperature trends. And so if you were thinking about a, a distribution, if you look at the, the sort of stylized distribution on the right hand side of the slide, 
you can see that represents the sort of middle part of, of the record. But we also have these tails. We have cold tails, extreme cold tails in the, in the 10th percentile, and we have extreme warm tails on the 90th percentile. And so if we look at what that actually means, we can strip away the, the interpolated surface and present what the trends are in the 50th percentile, which is the map in the middle, the 10th percentile is the map on the left, and the 90th percentile is the map on the right. And if you look at the 10th percentile, which is those extreme cold temperatures, you can see that there are a lot of blue triangles representing where temperatures are actually getting cooler. The trend is for more extreme cold temperatures. Um, and that's actually consistent if you look at the spatial distribution across the sort of central, um, or sorry, the eastern central parts of New South Wales, um, Victoria, and into Western Australia. So what we can find is a situation where we have the 10th percentile temperatures getting colder, so the extremes getting more extreme in terms of their cold, the 50th percentile getting warmer and the 90th percentile getting warmer. We can also get a situation where we have the 10th percentiles, those, te those really extreme temperatures getting warmer, the 50th percentiles getting warmer, but those very warm minimum temperatures actually getting cooler. So we can find these relationships in our temperature record um, if we look at the high quality stations and other station data. So when we look at the impact that climate change is actually having on um, these extreme uh, sort of 10th percentile um, temperatures, what we can see is that the period, uh, the number of, of these um, extreme temperature events is actually increasing. And these maps that you see in front of you show where uh, the frequency of frost events uh, are increasing or decreasing. So the blue color represents where they're increasing and the red representing where they're decreasing um, for individual months from April all the way through to November. So what you can see quite clearly is that in August, um, and September and July to some degree and June, there has been um, some increases in the um, frequency of um, frost events in New South Wales um, and in Victoria. And so if we look at August, in some instances, the increase in frequency has been of the order of about, uh, on average, five additional frost events in any particular year. What we're also seeing is a change in the frost window. And we calculate the frost window by looking at the start of the frost season. So the date at which the first temperature, which we would classify as a frost would occur and the end of the frost season, which is the last uh, event, which we would classify as a frost. And again, if you focus on the blue, the blue represents where the frost window is actually broadening. And the very dark blue um, points that you can see in Victoria rep represent a, an increase of the order of about 40 days. So the frost window is now 40 days longer than it was in the earlier part of the record. Now, what we can do is use our models to actually um, quantify the impact that those changes in, in the frost frequency and windows have had on, on crop production. And we, use, and we can use the APSIM model to actually um, calculate those impacts. So the slide that you can now see in front of you shows um, the impact of the frost change in the frost window and change in frost frequency um, that it has had on the most recent period uh, of the record, which I'm taking to be 1985 to, to sort of present day.
And so what you can see is that with this uh, analysis that we undertook, we looked at a range of different uh, varieties, short, mid and long season varieties. We looked at a range of different planting times and the maps that you're looking at here are the impact of planting either a short, mid or long season wheat variety on the 18th of May. And you can see that um, across most of the wheat belt, uh, the impacts for short season varieties uh, are as high as 40%. So those very dark areas would suggest productions as being reduced by the change in the frost window and frequency by as much as 40%. For mid and long season uh, wheats, on average across the whole wheat belt, the impacts have been much lower, on average around 23% for mid-season wheats and 8% for long-season varieties. So that's just if we look at the, the, the frost impacts, but what we can also look at is the change in um, the, the heat, um, so the occurrence of temperatures above 32 degrees. And this is some work my colleague actually presented at the uh, Gundawindi um, update, which shows the, the, the sort of change in the safe flowering window. So the first map on the left shows the, how the frosts are moving to later in the, in the year. So, uh, and the map on the right shows how the heat is actually occurring earlier in the year. So that frost, uh, the flowering window being narrowed by a later frost occurrence and an earlier heat occurrence. And she's actually quantified the impact of, of that on the flowering window using APSIM uh, model simulations as well. And so has shown that there is variation across the country but if you looked at the frost window for say the central Queensland region, it's shortened by about almost 10 days, which represents about a 17% reduction in the flowering window. And you can see that in the New South Wales areas, there's been some dramatic shortenings of the uh, flowering window um, upwards of that sort of 27% reduction. So, we can look at these impacts of, of the narrowing of the flowering window, the impact of drought, uh, and have a look at the impact that that has had on farm profitability. And this is um, some work from a colleague in ABARES, Neil Hughes, which has just recently been published. Um, and using um, a statistical model that he has derived from the um, ABARES survey data, the farm survey data, what uh, he's comparing is the sort of period of profitability pre and post 2000. And so you can see the areas of red showing where farm profitability has been negatively impacted by changing climate conditions. And that's quite pervasive across uh, New South Wales, the southern Queensland region and into Victoria and uh, across that sort of wheat belt in WA as well. So we know that the historical changes in temperature and rainfall are already uh, resulting in historical changes in production. So the question is, what does the future hold in terms of uh, changes in temperature and rainfall? And so if we look at the projection information that comes from the New South Wales, um, well, the, the University of, of Sydney um, in, with support from the New South Wales government, the projections that I'm showing you here for average temperature or mean temperature, which are on the left-hand side, minimum temperature in the middle and maximum temperature and an annual scale by 2030, the projections would suggest temperatures will rise by another sort of half to, to almost a degree um, warmer. There will be seasonal variation with greatest warming occurring in both spring 
and summer. So almost a degree warmer by 2030 in, in summer there you can see. In terms of, of rainfall, there um, would seem to be some shifts in the seasonality of rainfall. So by 2030, um, at an annual time scale, you can see that um, very little change in annual rainfall. So each of these bars, uh, what you're looking at here is the outcomes from a range of different models. So the thin black lines represent uh, an individual model output. The thick blue lines represent the average of that range. So you can see that annually, um, the blue line showing the average of that range, a little change, maybe a very, very slight decline in annual rainfall, uh, potentially a slight decline in, in summer, um, potentially increases in autumn rain, but declines in winter and spring of the order of about uh, four to about 7% uh, in winter and spring by 2030. So what that really means then is that we should start to think about the adaptation journey um, that we need in order to provide us some resilience to those future changes. We have, I suppose, been focusing um, on incremental changes, so small changes to our existing practice. But when we look at the sort of scale of changes that we might expect by 2030 or by 2050, we're going to have to start to think about more systemic or transformational changes. And there are many examples of where transformational change is already starting to, to occur. Um, many of you may know Peter Mailer, um, who's, who's a appeared in, in some of the local or regional New South Wales newspapers, who is now sort of shifted out of, um, not entirely out of cropping, but um, has reduced the area of cropping and has, has introduced um, solar panels um, onto that, that sort of area that he, he no longer crops. So he still he has livestock, uh, a smaller cropping component, but he now has uh, sort of solar farming. And so those are the sorts of adaptation options that are starting to be uh, explored for their viability going forward into the future. So that's where I'll end the presentation and happy then to, to field questions. Thank you for your attention. Yes, certainly that's a that's a good point. So, if we if we think about um, the the sort of way in which we've set up our rules of thumb in the past, um, we may have looked at the, a long period of record. Um, one of the ways of actually adapting to the changes that we're seeing is to actually maybe use the last ten or fifteen years as your surrogate for your rules of thumb in how you manage your property. And, and then start to look back each year at the last 15 years to say, well, have we seen a dramatic change? Do these rules of thumb that I currently use, are they still applicable? But continue to actually monitor those rules of thumb. So looking back using a sort of 10 or 15 year window, just to monitor how effective those rules of thumb have been because those will give you an idea of how resilient uh, those rules of thumb are to the, the changes, the rate of change that we're seeing.
but also the, the future changes that we might expect. Well, if, if we don't take global action to, to try and reduce emissions, we are committing ourselves to, to temperatures of the order of, of around three and a half degrees warmer to, uh, by, by that sort of 2050 to 2070 period. So really this, this idea of, of global action to try and slow down emissions is something that's going to become more and more important for us to actually be actively involved and in pursuing so that we can actually slow that that uh, rate of warming but also to actually reverse that that warming too we, we have the technologies um, we we have which are scalable um, to actually remove or reduce those emissions and so it's just a matter of trying to get that global, will together to try and uh, make it happen. Sure. Um, so that's that's what I'm calling the, the the frost paradox, actually. So as we as the average temperatures warm, um, what we're seeing is we're seeing um, a shift in that band of high pressure that usually sits over the country, and that's shifting further south, and it's actually intensifying. And so what that does is it actually um, produces or or ensures that we have these very stable cloudless conditions at night, which are very conducive for, for um, uh, radiative cooling. That combined with the, the drier conditions, if soils are very dry, they tend to lose heat very, very quickly. If they're moist, they tend to retain heat. So the combination of dry soils um, in enhanced atmospheric stability um, are leading to increase in the frequency of these um, nights which can get very very cold the the other the other component that we're also seeing because of that southward shift um, when when cold fronts actually do manage to actually break through that band of high pressure they're usually bringing air from much further south than they would have done in the past and so not only are our radiative cooling um, conditions increasing but the frequency of these very, very cold, what we call advective frost conditions are also increasing. 